all things to all men, um, Ather Piers now resumed the work among the OT, a mission on Lake Superior. While he did not relish the change, he had been completely won over by the Chippewas and felt that Bishop Rize had been ill advised in making it, he dismissed all thought of disobeying the orders of his superior and returned to Michigan to take up his new charge. My conscience induced me to discard the temptation and to obey, he confessed later in his life, because I must ever recognize and honor the will of God in the directions of my superior. For the next 12 years from 1840 to 1852, when he transferred to the newly formed Diocese of St. Paul, he labored indefatigably for the welfare of the Ottawas. He fulfilled literally St. Paul's definition of the priestly ministry by being all things to all men. Besides his spiritual ministrations, and these were manifold, he found time to conduct a school to teach the savages useful trades, especially gardening and farming, and to take care of their bodily ills with his homeopathic cures. When an epidemic of smallpox broke out in the missions under his charge, he journeyed from one to the other until he had inoculated every one of its inhabitants. A few years later, he did the same in the case of the dreaded cholera. How many lives he saved by this action is known only to God. But it is no wonder that Father Pierce endeared himself to the people wherever he went. No matter how costly the sacrifice, he was always to be found where he was needed. Most, the lesson of charity, which he taught his flock in season. And out of season by his own example was one they could not fail to appreciate. It was a language that they could understand, for it spoke far more eloquently to these children of the forest than the most meticulously prepared sermon. The extensive jurisdiction that was entrusted to Father Pierce upon his return to Michigan amply demonstrates the high esteem in which he was held by Bishop Rees. With Arbre Croche as his headquarters, all the missions from La Croix to Mashkigong, far to the south on the eastern coast of Lake Michigan, were placed under him. On the mainland, they included La Croix, which was the scene of his first labors, Middle Village, the original Arbre Croche of the 17th century, Cheboygan on Lake Huron, Aga Kachiving, about 12 miles from Arbre Croche, and Grand Traverse Bay. He also looked after the Indians living on the islands in Upper Lake Michigan, notably Beaver Island, and at Manistique on the opposite shore, too. Although Arbor Croce itself was a well-established mission, which had had a resident pastor for many years, a formidable task awaited Pierce here. Dispersed throughout the territory were about 600 baptized Indians and some 3,000 pagans. The routine work of caring for such a large mission was more than enough for one man. His days were well filled with the catechetical instructions on Sunday, the daily teaching of school, the very numerous confessions, and distant sick calls. Regarding his confessions at Arbre Croche, he had the following interesting observation to make to his friend Canon Sluga. Almost daily I hear many confessions, but seldom grant absolution ex defectu materiae, because most of the people still continue to live in baptismal innocence and have such delicate consciences that, for instance, if one forgets to make the sign of the cross before eating a potato, he confesses the hordeck, preaching to the Indians at Arbre Croche, omission as a grievous sin, weeping bitterly, and begs for a severe penance. For the first time since he had come to America, Father Pierce, albeit unwillingly, prepared to settle down to a life that would be more sedentary than that to which he had been accustomed. Rees and Baraga had concurred in issuing this directive. They may have felt that the welfare of the Ottawa missions called for this measure. Or, perhaps, they even thought that it would be beneficial to Pierce himself. The instability which he had manifested on several occasions was a matter of deep concern to both of them, for they were reluctant to lose a missionary who was as successful in the work as he had been. He had repeatedly threatened to leave the service of the Diocese of Detroit because he felt that the bishop did not understand him or his problems. The matter came up again in 1840, shortly after he was recalled to Michigan. At that time, he wrote to Father Francis Chenins, a redemptorist working in the Cincinnati Diocese, to intercede for him with his ordinary in obtaining a German parish in Ohio. Chenins seems to have gone ahead with all the arrangements, for when he wrote to Bishop Purcell, he urged him to appoint Pierce to Norwalk. The latter was a small community numbering about 50 Catholic families. 
which were predominantly German. Within a 60-mile radius, there were other small congregations, all of which could be taken care of from Norwalk. These varied in size from 10 to 60 families, mostly Irish, German, and French-Canadian in nationality. Two of these congregations, at Tiffin and Rockland, had already indicated a willingness to assume their share of the burden of providing a resident pastor with his livelihood, one agreeing to pay $10 for weekday services and the other $5. That this assignment would have suited a priest of Pierce's temperament is highly doubtful. Shenhins himself admitted that the people of Norwalk were very ready to promise things, but slow in keeping their promises. Moreover, the living conditions at Norwalk were almost as bad as the worst to be found on the Indian missions. Brother Joseph Reisach, a redemptorist lay brother who was stationed here in 1833 with Father Chenens, describes them in the following words. When I came to Norwalk, I found a blockhouse without door and windows and another frame building which was to be a church. We had no place to sleep in, therefore Father Chenens left on his apostolic excursions and said that he would not return before two rooms at least were ready. When winter was approaching, I asked for a helper, and Brother James was sent to us. During the winter, we were compelled to work in the open air most of the time. Drinking water was so bad and nauseating, especially in summer, that it could hardly be drunk with open eyes, for both in front and in the rear of the house there was a big swamp, foul water, from which filled also our cistern. When Bishop Purcell stopped with us on his visitation tour, he told us that the drinking of such water would surely make us sick. To purify the water, we used a kind of sugar which is obtained here from the sap of certain trees. Another plague were the stings of mosquitoes or gnats. Since we were surrounded on all sides by swamps and woods, the place was alive with these bothersome insects so that we could not stay outside during recreation time unless we drove them away by smoke. Naturally, this hurt the eyes. In the night, we heard the continuous noise made by toads, frogs, and turtles. In the adjoining woods, a great number of snakes were found, and among them, the poisonous rattlesnake. Time and again, snakes made their way into our rooms. Actually, Father Pierce never carried out his intention of placing himself under the jurisdiction of Bishop Purcell. He may have been persuaded to give in to Bishop Rizzi by his countryman Baraga, who many times over-exercised a restraining influence over him. Shenhens, writing to his ordinary under date of April 7, 1840, noted that he had received no further word from Pierce regarding his plans. As far as it is possible to determine, this passing reference completely closed the affair. At any rate, we find Father Pierce busy at his new post after the beginning of the year. Seemingly, he had resigned himself to the inevitable dictation of policy from above and decided to carry on his work as well as he could under the restrictions. Perhaps he even brought himself to the point where he was in complete accord with Reese's policy. A statement in one of his letters to Canon Sluga appears to confirm this conclusion. The consolation of converting heathens is becoming rarer, for the few pagans who resisted the grace of God on the first call to the faith are lost renitents, reserved to the justice of God. This was exactly the same reason that Reese had advanced some time previously in ordering Pierce to reduce the number of his missionary journeys. As far as the converts who lived at great distances from Arbor et Croche were concerned, he planned to help them by letters and prayers to God for their perseverance in the faith until providence shall lead me back to them. 14. Arbor et Croche prospered all through the years. It was under the administration of Father Pierce. His predecessors, De Jean, Baraga, and Sandro, had laid the groundwork well, and the Christian Indians of this village were solidly instructed in the faith. Every missionary who had worked with them or had had occasion to see their faith in action could vouch for their fervor. All the Indians followed the same mode of life, each. Morning and evening they met in the church for common prayer and assisted at Mass daily. With the greatest devotion did they prepare for the reception of the sacraments. Thus the women would hide in the woods for two weeks, intent upon the best way to prepare to receive Holy Communion. Of course, the missionary had to put an end to this form of retreat, as it caused the women to neglect their domestic duties. Likewise, the missionary was compelled to check their excessive fear of offending against purity by marrying. Girls were especially fearful in this regard. Frequently, the bride would change her mind on the way to the church and would break away from the bridegroom. Hence, the priest on occasion had to marry couples at unseasonable times to forestall the eleventh-hour disruption of the marital engagement. 
The conditions that prevailed at Arbor Croche were ideal for Father Pierce to put into operation plans which he had long entertained for improving the lot of the Indian by making each mission a model community of industry. From the beginning he had deplored the nomadic existence of the Indians of this region, regarding it as the greatest single obstacle to effective missionary work among them. Whatever initial success the missionary may have had, it was practically impossible for him to follow it up. The constant search for new hunting grounds kept the Indians in a state of perpetual motion and made extremely difficult the work of conversion. If the Indian could be induced to settle down and pursue an agricultural life or learn a trade that would guarantee him a livelihood the year round, the missionary could reasonably hope for some measure of permanency to attend his labors. Pierce had already tried this experiment on a small scale at his previous missions and had dis... Not until he came to Arbor Croche that he found it practical to give his ideas full play. By nature, the Ottawas were better suited for the manual arts than for intellectual pursuits. Pierce himself considered them inferior to the Chippewas in mental ability. The majority of them stubbornly resisted all forms of book knowledge. In view of this, he decided to place the emphasis on their economic rather than their intellectual improvement. They could be and were good Christians despite their lack of mental acumen. However, he did not discontinue the schools set up by his predecessors, for by doing this, he would have lost whatever financial assistance he received from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. By virtue of the treaty which the United States government made with the Ottawas in 1836, the latter were to be given approximately $5,000 each year for a period of 20 years to pay for new school buildings, salaries of teachers, and supplies. According to the report that Bishop Lefebvre submitted to the Indian Office for 1843, these schools seem to have been well attended. The five which came under the jurisdiction of Pierre's boasted an enrollment of 206 pupils, 69 in the school at Arbre Croche, 54 at La Croix, 27 at Middle Village, 16 at Cheboygan, and 40 at Manistee. 18. Only elementary subjects were taught, spelling, reading, and writing. The more capable students were permitted to take arithmetic and geography also. At our Bricroche, such practical handicrafts as sewing, knitting, and trimming with porcupines were included in the curriculum. Early in 1842, Father Pierce obtained a temporary leave of absence from the Ottawa missions to make a brief visit to Grand Portage. When he was ordered to abandon this mission in 1839, he had promised his beloved Chippewas that he would return to them himself or send another in his place. Because of the scarcity of priests, he was never able to do the latter. Hence, he implored his bishop to give him permission to satisfy this obligation personally. Since Grand Portage had been reduced to a mere shadow of its former self, Pierce did not stop there but directed his guides to paddle to a new site on the Pigeon River about four miles beyond. The Chippewas, who had been awaiting his arrival at the old mission, followed him in their canoes. Upon disembarking at Pigeon River, he was literally swamped by the affectionate greetings of his former flock. Tears coursed down the cheeks of the venerable missionaries, he told them, that though he longed to, he could not stay with them permanently. He had assured his bishop that he would be back. In Michigan before winter set in, and made travel impossible. Under his supervision, the Indians set to work immediately and erected a temporary bark chapel in which he could offer mass daily and conduct his services. The days were all too short for Pierre's. Up at the break of dawn, he utilized every available moment, instructing his charges in the faith, treating their bodily ills, and teaching them something of gardening and agriculture. He had brought a plentiful supply of seeds and young fruit trees with him from Michigan, and these he distributed among them. To increase their food supply further, he showed them how to use a fish net, which he had bought for them for $70. Formerly, their primitive methods of fishing had made it necessary for them to be out on the lake most of the day to provide enough fish for the whole village. With the net, a few hours each evening sufficed to bring in a catch which proved ample to feed all of them. The time thus saved, they devoted to the new pursuit of agriculture. He also opened a little school and placed it in charge of a young Indian by the name of David Mackenbines, who had a fair education. By midsummer, 45 pupils were enrolled in it. The missionaries report to James Ord, who had succeeded, 
Schoolcraft, as superintendent of the Indian agency at Sol Stay, Marie stated, This school was established last spring by me. In this school, children are not only taught the knowledge of religion, but also such things as are conducive for the ordinary lives of both sexes. It is hoped that the school will be kept up and promote the education and civilization of the Indians, that it may also prove itself worthy of the kind attention and fostering aid of the government. Father Pierce bade a fond farewell to his Chippewa flock on October 15, 1842, and went back to Arbre Croche. He did not see them again until the summer of 1847, when he paid them another brief and final visit. The prosperity of the mission surprised him. Although the Indians had had no one to supervise them, they had not neglected their agricultural pursuits, and he found the fields around the mission planted with potatoes. Many families had their own gardens besides. Most of the Indians were well-dressed and lived in substantial lodges. Even their religious practices had not been abandoned, and they did as well as they could without the services of a priest. The missionary used the occasion to renew their fervor and to instruct, and baptize those families which had moved in since his last visit. He left Pigeon River on August 16th, accompanied by some 50 Indians who escorted him to La Pointe where he was to meet his countryman, Father Scola. He reached there at the same time that hundreds of Indians from the surrounding territory arrived to receive their annual payment from the government. Many of these were Chippewas from the upper Mississippi, and the zealous priest availed himself of the opportunity to preach to them on the Catholic religion. One of the Chippewa chiefs invited him to return with his tribe to their village. Piers replied that this was impossible at the moment but that perhaps at some future date he could accept this invitation. At La Pointe, he also met the Jesuit, Father Pierre Schoen, who was stationed at Manitoulin Island, and pleaded with him to look after his Chippewa missions at Grand Portage and Pigeon River. Father Schoen gave his word to visit these missions at the first opportunity, and even promised to establish a residence at one or the other if the situation called for it. Eventually, the Pigeon River site was chosen as the more promising, and three members of the Society of Jesus were dispatched to reopen the mission. The above-mentioned Father Schoen, another priest, Father Nicholas Fremiot, and a cojuter brother, Brother de Puder. Fremiot, the chronicler of the little band, has given us this account of their arrival. Towards noon, we enter this other Jordan, which waters our promised land, but here there are no Jebusites to wage war against no one to dispute our peaceable possession of it. We step ashore, and what do we see? Here and there some unfinished houses, in some places the poles of a deserted lodge still standing, then, upon a prominence near the bank of the river, a log church which formerly lacked only the roof, but which now is falling into ruin bit by bit, a little farther on a house, or, if one prefers, a cabin with a single room, through chinks in whose roof one may see the sky. This is the house which is destined for us. A missionary, Father Pierce, built it, and also the church. That was five years ago. Then, frightened with the difficulties which the mission then offered, he abandoned it to go to Solste. Marie, he is today in Arbre Croche, an Ottawa mission on Lake Michigan. In this house we found two chairs and a table. Behold the kindly providence. They stayed at the Pigeon River Mission until the summer of 1849 when the Jesuit superior ordered the transfer of the residents to nearby Fort William. From that date on, these missions were taken care of from the latter place. After leaving the Chippewa missions for the second time in 1842, Father Piers resumed his apostolate among the Ottawas. Arbre Croche continued to make progress under his supervision, even though it was only his sheer willpower and the obedience he owed to his bishop that kept him at his post. He possessed a profound sense of duty, and no matter how intense his own personal dissatisfaction, he did his work well. He instilled the spirit of self-reliance in his Indian charges and encouraged native talents. Under his type of supervision, they were industrious, as is evident from the number of trades that flourished in. Aubrey Croche Farming was the principal occupation pursued by all, but one could also find expert carpenters, cabinet makers, tinners, and masons. The women became efficient housekeepers. Some of them were skilled in weaving and made much of the wearing apparel for their families. Father Piers' zeal and energy must be credited with these remarkable results. 
In 1845, a government commission sent to Arbre Croche to investigate social conditions among the Ottawas was astonished at what it found. Instead of a half-civilized tribe of savages living in dilapidated huts, they discovered a civilized and industrious community. The village was well laid out, the homes were substantial and solidly constructed, and orderly family life was very much in evidence. A modest but neat church erected by the Indians themselves stood in the center of the settlement. The majority of families had thriving gardens adjoining their homes. Farming was conducted on a communal basis, and the planting and cultivating of the fields of corn and potatoes was a cooperative project in which all the inhabitants capable of working engaged. In temperance, the curse of the red man was practically non-existent. Once it had been a serious threat to the welfare of the community, the peers had begun a relentless war against it soon after his arrival. In the early years of his crusade against the evils of the liquor traffic, the results were discouraging. The crux of the problem was how to control the activities of the unscrupulous traders who peddled the whiskey to the Indians for their own mean ends. As long as Pierce could not rid the settlement of these unprincipled men, he was powerless to Christianize the Indians. In writing of this problem to the Leopoldine Association, Pierce complained bitterly that they put all possible obstacles in the way of the missionary, aiming to retard as long as possible the agricultural training of the Indians in favor of their own sordid interests. Unsparingly, he denounced these vicious men who exploited the savage. When pleas and threats failed to make them come to terms, he went directly to the authorities in charge of the Indian agency to protest their harmful presence near the missions where they undermined whatever good the missionaries were able to do. In some cases, this protest would be effective, and a conscientious superintendent would ban their traffic. The old missionary used even more stringent methods with those of his own flock who might have become addicted to the vice. He excoriated them publicly from the pulpit. He organized temperance societies in all of his missions and obliged his parishioners to perpetual abstinence from all intoxicating drink. That these measures were effective is evident from the fact that on one occasion when a trader brought several barrels of cheap whiskey to Aubrey Croche, not one of his Indians would so much as taste a drop of it. After a few days of futile bargaining, the trader packed up his goods and departed unceremoniously. There was little time for Pierce to bemoan his misfortune in. Having to abandon the Chippewa missions, the widespread territory over which he exercised jurisdiction kept him busy from early morning until late at night. During the summer, months, he had all he could do to make the rounds of his scattered stations. Most of the journeys were made on foot, although Pierce traveled by water when it was possible to do so. He carried all of his belongings strapped to his back and with a stout stick to aid him, tramped from place to place in all kinds of weather. Frequently, one or two Indians would accompany him on these trips, carrying his canoe on their shoulders. He is credited with accomplishing another prodigious feat in 1842, and again in 1846, when single-handed he saved a major portion of the Indian population of northern Michigan from certain death. The first time a smallpox epidemic broke out among them, he immediately sent one of the Indians to Mackinac Island to summon the government doctor. The latter himself was ill, but he sent Pierce a supply of the inoculation virus with instructions on how to give it to the stricken Indians. The missionary proved himself equal to the situation. He set out to vaccinate the whole population, a truly Herculean undertaking. He went from village to village and from house to house, and before completing his rounds had attended more than 900 Indians. Such spontaneous charity was characteristic of him, and he thought nothing of this action which brought him the well-merited praise of government officials and Indians alike. His motives were completely altruistic. No desire for human acclaim prompted him to undertake the arduous task. He was too far removed from youth to wish to appear in the role of a hero. Writing to the Prince Bishop of Vienna in 1846 when the epidemic struck again, he said, I am about to visit all my remaining stations to vaccinate the Indians and save them from the terrible malady. God grant that in my old age, I am already 60, I may still successfully bear the hardships of the winter's travel. 
Still, I am ever prepared to sacrifice my life for my flock, especially as I expect on this journey to gain the souls of some savages for God. A small number of those are still to be found in my missions who have rejected the grace of God. Some extraordinary event, some special visitation or superabundant grace may lead them into the fold of Christ. Journeys of this kind are frequently of great spiritual importance. As far as can be ascertained, there was a marked improvement in the relations of Pierce with his bishop after his return from Pigeon River. For Lefebvre had succeeded Rees as administrator of the Diocese of Detroit in 1841. More even tempered than his predecessor, he was blessed with the happy faculty of getting along with priests and people alike. Pierce found in him an understanding and sympathetic ordinary who could appreciate the many and varied problems that constantly harassed the missionaries. His fatherly counsels had a soothing effect on the often impetuous Pierce. Gradually, he succeeded in closing the rift which had grown between the priest and the ordinary during Reese's last years in office. To be sure, occasional differences still arose, but most of these were settled to everyone's satisfaction. The burden of looking after the interests of the widely scattered Ottawa missions was made lighter in 1845 when Bishop Lefebvre sent Pierre's an assistant in the person of Father Ignatius Marek. The latter was a Slovene compatriot who had only recently arrived in the United States to work among the Indians. For two years he lived with Pierce at Arbre Croche and alternated with the veteran missionary in visiting the mission stations. In July of 1847, Lefebvre made a visitation of their villages and divided the territory between the two priests, giving Arbre Croche, Cheboygan, Agakachiving, and Grand Traverse to Pierce. Rack was placed in charge of La Croix, which he made his headquarters, and Middle Village, Castor Island, and Manistee. The new arrangement placed some 600 souls, within the limits of Mac's jurisdiction and a little more than, twice that number under Pierce, but even this proved to be too great a responsibility for the aging missionary. And after Mac left him, he interceded with Lefebvre to send him another helper. Nothing came of this petition, although Pierce had hoped that the bishop would allow him to invite a friend of his to come to Michigan. This was Father Ivo Levis, who was then the chaplain for a community of nuns in Pennsylvania. While Lefebvre sorely needed priests, he was interested only in those of stable character, who were willing to devote their entire lives to the task of building up the church in the Detroit area. Levis was a good and talented priest, but he did not meet the latter requirement. He was a Franciscan biding his time until he could make a foundation of his order somewhere in the United States. If he came to Michigan, it could be only on a temporary basis, and experience had shown that this did more harm than good. Moreover, he was willing to leave his present post only if he were assigned to help Pierce Arbre Croche. The bishop would not hear of such an arrangement and ordered Pierce to tell the man not to come. The missionary smarted under this seeming rebuff from his superior. Fully confident that Levise would be acceptable, he had already advised him to come to Detroit and present himself to Lefebvre in person. Now it was Pierce's embarrassing duty to inform Levis that he had not been accepted. Unsuccessful, though, he was in getting another assistant at. This time, Pierce did not give up hope. Year after year, with annoying persistence, he continued to petition Lefebvre. He gave as his reasons his advanced age and his physical inability to attend to the many duties alone. When his pleas seemed to fall on deaf ears, he informed the bishop that he wished to leave the service of the Diocese of Detroit, and that if his release were not granted, he would pack up his belongings and return, 30, to his native land. Lefebvre was not taken completely by surprise at this development. Pierce had threatened to leave before, Moreover, Baraga had written him in the spring that Pierce was extremely dissatisfied with him. Hence, his reply to Pierce was simple and direct. He pointed out to the priest his duty before God, saying that Pierce's desire to abandon his work showed a misplaced zeal and was entirely contrary to the virtue of prudence, that for him to leave the mission would in fact be a great wrong and the cause of irreparable harm to religion. Apparently, the bishop's words had the desired effect, since Pierce did not leave Arbre Croche. A few years later, in 1850, Father Baraga obtained permission to send him his own assistant, a young Belgian priest, 
Father Andrew Van Pamel. The latter had already done good work at Lons. He seemed to be a born missionary, for he experienced no great difficulty in adjusting himself to the rigors of life among the savages. Baraga was reluctant to part with such an able worker, but he hoped that Piers would more surely give up the idea of leaving Michigan if he were given an assistant. Crises like these developed frequently during the years that Father Piers labored in the Diocese of Detroit. Some were of his own making and could have been avoided if he had had a little more patience. Others, however, arose from circumstances over which he had no control. One such was his fight to keep the Ottawas from being dispossessed of their lands. The chiefs had met with representatives of the federal government in 1836 and had signed a treaty by which they ceded to the United States all their lands north of the Grand River with the exception of 50. 0000, zero, zero, zero acres on Little Traverse Bay, 70,000 north of the Marquette River, 1,000 on the Cheboygan River, and 1,000 on the Thunder Bay River. These latter they retained for their own use, for the others they were to be given monetary remuneration. However, the same treaty left unsolved the problem of their legal status. Less than a decade after the conclusion of this treaty, surveyors arrived on the scene to measure the land and divide it into smaller parcels. Everything seemed to indicate that the government was about to open this hitherto closed territory to white settlement. Pierce was fearful of such an eventuality, for it would spell doom for his missions. By the terms of their treaty, the Indians had agreed to their removal to lands west of the Mississippi when that day came or to their restriction within the narrow confines of a reservation in close proximity to the white man. In either case, their faith would be endangered, in the former, by the pagan atmosphere in which they would be obliged to live, in the latter, by contamination from the whites. A possible alternative that suggested itself was voluntary migration of the Indians to Canada. The British had already tried to woo the Ottawas by offering them certain desirable islands in the Great Lakes region where they might live in peace and security. If they succumb to such inducements, they could conceivably constitute a menace to the United States in time of war. In August 1843, the missionary appealed directly to the President of the United States, John Tyler, begging him to intervene in behalf of the savages. He asked that the Ottawas be emancipated and granted the rights of citizenship. This would permit them to buy and settle lands on the same basis as white men. We have no record of Tyler's reply to this petition, and the suggestion was not acted upon until after Piers had left Michigan. But the Indian office did make a special ruling that permitted the Indians under his care to buy lands and settle them. Pierce was gratified with this concession and urged the red men to buy tracts in common so that unscrupulous speculators could not purchase vacant parcels among them and drive them out. He even contributed $5 of his own money for each purchase in order that he might be considered a partial owner of all the land bought and thus have an active voice in its ultimate disposal. The closing years of this decade witnessed a gradual but not complete emancipation of the Indian in Michigan. Important legislative acts were passed that helped him to fit better into the changing scene. The white man's civilization was creeping closer and closer to his ancestral hunting grounds. This was inevitable. The red man had to condition himself to these circumstances, and the more he resigned himself to this trend and was prepared to adjust himself according to the new way of life, the better was his chance for survival. To what extent Pierre's or the other missionaries were responsible for the favorable legislation, it is difficult to determine. In the final analysis, it is also unimportant. What is important, however, is that the Indian was placed on a more equal footing with his white neighbor. In 1847, the Michigan legislature petitioned Congress to grant the Ottawa Indians a general permission to buy and retain property no matter where it was situated. The request was not granted at the time on the score that it was too universal in its application. Three years later, the Constitution of the state gave the franchise to resident Indians who were not living with their tribes. In the summer of that same year, a small group of Chippewas Menominees and Potawatomis living in Michigan were relocated on lands west of the Mississippi. Pierce's flocks at Arbrecroche, Lacroix, and Middle Village were allowed to keep their homes with the provision that the Indians of the same cultural level should be permitted to join them. He was satisfied with this arrangement. It was official recognition from the government 
that he had done his work well. At the same time, it gave him an opportunity to bring under the influence of the missions such of the remaining Indians as showed promise. However, these hopes were short-lived. While it is true that the populations of these villages increased, the zeal of the natives themselves for religion began to decline. The white man had moved too close to them, and many of Piers' people came under the harmful influence. Once again, the liquor problem arose to hamper his work. The Indian agent at Mackinac, Robert Stewart, who was in charge of handing out the annual. Government dole to the Ottawas was not prompt in making these payments. Sometimes the savages were obliged to wait on the island for weeks before receiving the money, and the enforced idleness led to all sorts of immoral excesses. The whiskey peddlers made capital of this. In the fall of 1847, for example, Pierce's charges squandered on whiskey all the money which had been put aside to meet the land payments. Still others succumbed to the proselytizing of the Presbyterian minister at Grand Traverse, a Mr. Doherty. This Protestant divine had more than once aroused the ire of the Catholic missionary. With much more money to spend than Pierce, he lured some of the Arbor Croce Indians to his mission with grandiose promises of a superior education and material advantages that the Catholic mission was unable to give them. Pierce resented these underhanded tactics and openly rejoiced when the Grand Traverse mission was forced to close its doors. This eventuality was due to the lack of converts. Even those who had originally gone over to the Presbyterian camp came back to the Catholic fold humble and repentant. One can detect a note of triumph in Pierce's observation on the failure of the Presbyterian mission, but in spite of this, the busy missionary could not, after ten years of toil and expensive mission institutions, enroll more than two dozen redskins on the register of his faith. These, however, later on went over to the Catholic banner, or beat the drum with the rest of the pagans, and danced with the whiskey bottle, so that the insulted and chagrined missionary made preparations at Easter for his departure. Thus the great opposition mission in Grand Traverse has faded out, after spending a sum of more than $50,000, 35. After 1850, Father Pierce renewed his efforts to secure his release from the Detroit diocese. He had learned that Bishop Creighton of St. Paul had called for volunteers to help staff his huge diocese, which covered an area of 166, 0, 0, 0, 0 square miles and was coterminous with the new territory of Minnesota. No less than three times during that year, Pierce wrote to Bishop Lefebvre, begging leave to go to Minnesota. With the Ottawa's missions on the decline, he was convinced that his usefulness in Michigan was at an end. He felt that Merak and Van Pamel could adequately care for the remaining missions, and suggested that the former be stationed at Grand Traverse and the latter. At La Croix, the long-awaited release was granted on October 21, 1851. Piers, veteran of almost 16 years' service in Michigan and now 66 years old, prepared to depart for his new field of labor in the spring. His last assignment under the Detroit jurisdiction was in Mackinac, where he spent the winter months. In his final communication with Lefebvre, he expressed the sincere hope that his release had been granted willingly and that he was departing for Minnesota with the blessing of his bishop. Thus came to a close the Michigan period of this remarkable Indian missionary.